If you could all take your seats, we'd like to begin now. Good morning, classmates, deans, faculty, staff, and distinguished guests. My name is Jasmine Neal, and I'm a first year medical student here at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and the president of the first year class. I'd like to welcome you all to the 2017 Ceremony of Thanks. This event is the culmination of the tireless efforts of myself, many of my classmates, the directors of the Donated Bodies Program, and faculty and staff here at the School of Medicine. I cannot thank them enough for their work. But most importantly, I'd like to thank you. The families of those selfless individuals who willingly donated their remains to further our medical education. It has been an honor to learn from the gift of your loved ones and one that myself and my classmates have not taken lightly. Throughout this first year of medical school, we have learned a tremendous amount about the human body. Countless hours spent in rigorous labs and lectures have taught us what the body's normal physiological processes are and what happens in disease when they go wrong. But so much of what we have learned this year has focused on also the art of medicine and human interaction, not just the science. We are told as student doctors that we can learn as much from our patients as they can from us. And the statement could not have been truer in how much we've learned from our first patients, your loved ones. Though they knew they would not benefit directly from their gift, they were able to teach us as first year medical students more than just anatomy, but the ideals of generosity and selflessness that are at the foundation of medicine. It was truly a privilege to be able to have this experience and one that would not have been possible without each and every one of your families. As the ceremony continues today, you will hear from other students in song, prose, and in conversation after the ceremony. Though we will never be able to thank you enough, I hope that we are able to express even a small amount of the gratitude that we have for your loved ones and families in helping us grow and learn as physicians and human beings this year. It is because of their gift that we are able to be the best physicians that we could possibly be. There's nothing that could replace the loss of a loved one. But I hope that you find solace in knowing that their lives live not only through you, but in us, the class of 2020, and in each and every patient we will serve in the future. Thank you again for your loved one's gift, and thank you again for being here with us today. I'd now like to introduce you to Dr. Elena Stark, a beloved faculty member who has been an integral part of our first year. Dr. Stark is a chair of our anatomy curriculum and the director of the education part of the Donated Body Program. Dr. Stark. Hello everyone, our warmest welcome to all of you, the families of our wonderful donors. Like Jasmine said, we are delighted that you are here today to celebrate the generosity and the altruism of your loved ones. And also we are delighted that you're here to be with us as we express our gratitude for uh, your loved one's gift to our school, the medical school here at UCLA. I am the chair of anatomy and the director of one of the labs where a very high number of donors uh, remains are used for education and research. So I thought I'd spend a few minutes telling you a little bit of what we do. First education, I honestly can say we would not be able to offer our students the excellent education that we provide them if it was not for your loved one's gift. Anatomy is a foundational block 
of medical education and medical science. If one does not know the structure of the body, then how could one understand how the body works or how the body gets diseased or most importantly, how to treat the disease in the body? So we have to start by giving our students a very solid foundation on the structure of the body and that is anatomy. So sure there are all tools to study anatomy other than human remains such as models uh, and some new tools that are very cool such as plastination and even virtual models. So you may have seen some students in some medical schools putting on goggles and then they do virtual dissections on uh, specimens and it's all virtual. But you know, patients in real life are not virtual. And so it is a must that we have gifts like the one of your loved ones in order to educate our medical students, our dental students, as well as our residents. I'll tell you a little bit about that too. Nothing can replace human remains in medical training, not only to teach anatomy, but also to teach necessary medical skills to our students and residents. So as the students here in our school, as the students progress through the curriculum, they review anatomy in second year, in third year, in fourth year, they continue to come to the anatomy lab. And then especially in the fourth year, before they become residents, they spend a lot of time in the anatomy lab, some of them, again, practicing those skills, either surgical skills or basic medical skills or emergency uh, medicine type of skills. So for example, we have now in two weeks, we will, we will have all 180 fourth year medical students coming to the lab. And then some of them in the fourth year will come several more times, right? And so what do they do? They practice procedures in the anatomy lab. So when it's time to practice those procedures with live patients, they don't make mistakes. That's very important. We don't want our residents to try new procedures on live patients. We'd rather they come to the anatomy lab and they practice and practice and then they perfect those skills. So when they are residents, they're dealing with live patients, they can do a good job. A few years ago, I was in Europe at a conference and I was chatting with some of my colleagues from other European medical schools, other schools there. And they mentioned that in some schools in the previous few years, they had tried to cut down the uh, number of uh, cadaver used in medical schools and either cut it down or almost uh, eliminate it. Well, what happened was those students who went to those schools at that time graduated, they became residents, and now they realized that they were at a disadvantage. They had not been trained with real human remains and they were not as good on some of these procedures and their knowledge of anatomy as other students. So it was interesting, it was kind of a grassroots movement. These residents go to get, got together and they went back to the medical school and demanded that human remains be reinstated in the medical school and that the medical students be taught with actual remains. No modern tool can replace human remains in medical training. And for that, we are grateful to our school because of their enormous support to the anatomy lab and to um, that part of our curriculum. And I was thinking, if I were in your place today, one question that I would have would be whether my loved one remains were treated with respect. And one of the most important things that I will tell you this morning is that yes, they were, absolutely. They were treated with professionalism, they were treated with care, and they were treated with respect. From day one, I see the first year students, the second week of the curriculum. And at that point, first day they meet me, they know what the expectation is. And the bar is very high. Because what's our motto, students? We are going to treat our donors' remains in the same exact way, with the same respect, love, and care as we would like any student, any medical student anywhere, to treat the remains of our own loved ones. Is that true, students? Yes. And that's what we do. That's exactly what we do. 
Of course, this culture of respect comes from the very top. We are extremely fortunate to have Dr. Alan Robinson, not only as our senior associate dean here in our school, but as the responsible executive officer of the Donated Body Program. Dr. Robinson personifies respect. He treats everybody with respect. I've known him for many years. I've never seen him direct his attention to anyone without respect. And that, of course, trickles down. That trickles down to the faculty in the school, that trickles down to the staff, and to the students. Then, of course, the Donated Body Program, they uh, have the same culture. The director, please turn your heads to the back, our wonderful director, Mr. Fisher, he's the director of the Donated Body Program. The assistant director, Mr. Seams, he's sick, but he's wonderful. <laughs> A very, very important uh, member of our team, Ms. Mr. Alex Rodriguez. And then, of course, the person who holds the whole donated, donated body program together, the glue of the donated body program, and that's Nikki Harris. They all do an amazing job. Yes, please, <laughs> hand it up. Before I conclude my brief remarks today, let me tell you a little bit about research. I'll be brief, but that's an important uh, component of what we do in the anatomy lab. So we, had, uh, we have three general categories of research that we do. One is what we like to call the uh, anatomical variation uh, type of research. And those are studies that we do when we find variations in organs, in, in maybe a muscle, a vein, a nerve, an artery. Uh, we find variations that are not abnormal necessarily, they just are not typical. And so we document those very carefully and we publish them. Uh, we have had many, many over the years published in anatomical journals, in surgical sur uh, journals, radiological. We go to conferences in surgery, etc. Those are very important and useful to know, especially for radiologists and for surgeons. They need to know what variations are possible in an organ that, again, it's not necessarily disease that it just looks atypical, non-typical. So um, they may encounter a, a nerve that doesn't look exactly like it is described in an anatomy book or an atlas. And because of these anatomical variation uh, publications, they know how to proceed. The second category of research that we do has to do with transplants. You may know that here at UCLA, we're very fortunate to have one of the largest transplant programs in the world. And the anatomy lab has collaborated in some studies that were necessary before those operations actually were executed with uh, live patients. Uh, transplants of, of course, liver, kidney, larynx, the voice box. Uh, you may have heard about hand transplants at UCLA, face transplants, et cetera. These procedures are extremely complicated and they have many steps. The process of perfecting these techniques and these surgical techniques are complicated. And some of these steps have to be rehearsed again and again many times in the anatomy lab before they can actually be done with live patients again, right? So for example, an example I could give you is a transplanted organ. How is it going to be innervated? What nerves are going to be connected to that transplanted organ? Where, where are those nerves going to be coming from? How are they going to be attached to the transplanted organ, et cetera? So all of those procedures have to be done in the anatomy lab with uh, human remains. The third category is the other category. And there I will give you a couple of examples of several studies that we've been doing with the anesthesiology uh, department. So um, more and more now in, in uh, anesthesia, uh, we are trying to avoid uh, putting patients under general anesthesia unless absolutely necessary. Why? Because that's quite taxing to the body. So we try more and more to target organs and target nerves that need to be under anesthesia in order to exercise a procedure, to execute a procedure. So what do we do? Well, we uh, try many times in the anatomy lab with remains such as those of your loved ones 
where we inject the anesthetic exactly in a spe very specific place where it's going to be blocking a nerve or a ganglion that's a nervous structure. And then what we do is we dissect that area and make sure that the medicine, the anesthetic in this case, went exactly where it was supposed to be. That it didn't leak anywhere, it didn't bleed anywhere, it didn't affect other organs that where it was not supposed to be. So you see how many of these procedures have to be tried many times before they can be perfected and used in live patients. And that is one of your loved one's contribution. A wish of your loved one was that we put their remains to good use. And I would like to assure you that we did. I think that, and I believe they would be very proud that their gift, their generous gift, was used not only to educate some of the finest medical students anywhere. I know I'm biased, but <laughs> some of the finest students anywhere. And I believe they would be proud that their gift also made possible advances in the medical field that would have not been possible without their gift. The memory of your loved ones lives in our students, in the faculty, in our staff. It lives in the collective mind of our school and forever will. Like one of our students wrote very eloquently in the program that you have, he said that the memory of your loved one will live on in each patient that I will see. And I think that is very true. I could go on and on because I'm so passionate about all of this, but I will leave it at that. I hope that you have a chance to stay and mingle and have some refreshments afterwards and get to know our wonderful students and uh, give us the opportunity and the chance to get to know you a little bit. Please ask any question that you may have. At the end, we will be more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarek. Next, we'd like to invite Dr. Alan Robinson to give a few remarks. Um, as Dr. Stark warmly introduced him earlier, um, Dr. Robinson is the Associate Vice Chancellor of the David Geffen School of Medicine and the responsible Executive Officer for the Donated Bodies Program. Dr. Robinson. Can you all hear me? Because I'm a little bit further from the microphone <laughs> than Elena. Okay, um, I'd just like to give you a little bit of history of these uh, ceremonies. When I first came to UCLA some 23 years ago, the, um, th there, we didn't have any formal ceremonies. The students just got together in a student lounge over in another building because they were so grateful that they, as, as was described, that they ha had this interaction with their first patient. So they would sit there and and exchange ideas similar to the things that they've written in the program today. Somebody would come just spur of the moment and, and play an instrument. And, and then they started inviting some of the faculty to come. So I was among the faculty that was invited to come participate in this. I just, I watched. But, um, and then a few years ago we thought, well, these are, these are such wonderful ceremonies and the students are, so grateful for their gift. Why don't we tell the family members how grateful they are and what a wonderful gift it is? So it's only been a few years that we have been inviting family members and I'm, I'm delighted to see so many of you here and I'm sure you're delighted to understand the value of the gift and uh, the role it's played in medical education. So these first year students, that's what's here mostly today, they'll be moving on into their other training, their clinical years, and pretty soon we'll have graduation for the students who are moving out of our school and moving on with their life. So it's a time that um, I always, you know, I think back, like when I was a student, I think back, it just, each year it's a wonderful thing about being in a school, you, you think back about when you were a student. When I was there, x-rays 
were on a plastic film with a silver emulsion. There was nothing digital. There were no CAT scans, there were no MRI scans, there were no PET scans. We held up these pieces of plastic and looked through them. I remember as a young faculty member uh, with, a, um, with a neurosurgeon, he and I were planning a surgical, we were evaluating a patient for a neurosurgical procedure. And it was the first time that we had seen an MRI of the head. And we stood there and looked at it. And the neurosurgeon turned to me and he said, I, it seems like we're looking at things that we shouldn't even be able to look at. We don't, you know, like we didn't have permission to see this much inside this brain. Of course, now they're very common. We use MRIs to evaluate strokes. We use them uh, to evaluate infections in the, in the brain, to evaluate tumors in the brain. But I can tell you the first time, it was just remarkable, the information that we got from an MRI. All of us, there were no digital, there were no medical records except for on paper. We digital, very um, diligently recorded our handwritten notes on, on a paper chart. Uh, since I was a student, many, many new drugs have been discovered. Many of them I, I can't name you, name for you. But the one thing that hasn't changed is a human body. The brain's still in the same place. It has all those same structures that it did when I was a student. All of the organs are in the same place, the heart's in the same place, the lungs are in the same place, the liver's there, the kidney's there. All of those things, of all the things I learned in medical school, the thing that I learned that's still the same is anatomy. So I've moved on, I do other things, but I, I still know the human body. I still can understand and teach anatomy because it hasn't changed. So if someone gave, the, gave uh, our medical school a gift of a bunch of textbooks, well, they would be out of date probably by the time they were given, certainly very shortly after that. If they, if they gave us a bunch of microscopes, we would say, well, now we use one microscope that we control and we show the image digitally on a screen. We don't spend a lot of time looking under those microscopes anymore. Yet students can learn from a human body exactly as I did from a human body. So that has not changed. MRIs and CAT scans were first done on human bodies. And as um, Dr. Stark told you, a lot of the training of, uh, training of physicians is done with human bodies. And it's very essential. But they can do it, and we can teach it, because it's still the same. It's a treasured resource that gives knowledge, as Jasmine, I think, said long after these students are gone. So I give my thanks to you, I give my thanks to your family member for this generous, unselfish gift to the School of Medicine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. We'd now like to transition into the student reflection and performance portion of the program featuring members of the first year class. Please give a warm welcome to Orly Bell and Emmanuel Aguilar Casada performing Let It Be. Let it be, let it be, let it be, 
Thank you, Emma and Orly. Next, we'll have a student reflection by Kenny Ferenczak, followed by a poem by our own Mildred Galvez. What an awesome privilege. Beauty in form, beauty in function. Beauty in parts, beauty in systems. Beauty in universality, beauty in variation. Beauty in the immediate act, beauty in the lasting impact. Exploring the form of the human body immediately impresses on the observer the significance of millennia of adaptation. Intricate networks of vessels, tendons, and passageways brilliantly interweaving. These tissues sculpt a form brilliant in and of itself. 
but an appreciation for the resulting function is a remarkably humbling realization of whatever creed is your own. Evolution, intelligent design, and natural chaos are all means to a common end that anyone in an anatomy lab cannot deny is deserving of reverence. In a world of gross disparity and ridiculous prejudice manufactured by man's shortcomings, a survey of the lab's specimens quickly puts into perspective how thin of a veil our skins are over the common machinery that drives us all. Efficient infrastructure connecting our vital systems also connect us all. And so do the inefficiencies and maladaptations that are also inherent in each one of us. The beauty of universalism is undeniable, but perhaps even more poignant are those discrepancies and vulnerabilities that make each member of the human species an independent being. To learn and appreciate a body is to do just that, to learn and appreciate a single body. Every individual provides its unique set of lessons and wonders in the anatomy lab, a lesson which we can only hope would be appreciated and recognized more frequently outside of the laboratory. The gift of these loved ones to our institution of learning is a beautiful act of generosity, courage, and humanity. Every moment spent with their forms were powerful experiences of teaching, skill acquisition, and shaping of our approach to the medical profession. The value of their gift is already cemented by those moments and the significance will only multiply through the years as we all carry with us the unforgettable knowledge gifted to us by these, our very first patients. Hello everyone, my name is Mildred, and I just want to say it is a privilege to have all of you here. And it's also a great privilege for me to be able to speak to you. So this poem is called Unspoken Words, and it is dedicated to my mother. If tears were drops pouring from the sky, I have flooded many cities remembering you. If tears could wash away the pain, I have been reborn over and over again. What would I give to see you one last time? <laughs> to tell you I love you. To tell you you formed my world. I wish I could tell you I'm sorry. I'm sorry for not realizing how much you meant until after you left. I wish I could share those unspoken words. The pain will never leave, and the tears will never cease. But likewise, the memories will never die, and my love for you will never perish. You taught me to be strong. You taught me how to turn a storm into a rainbow, a frown into a smile, a sob into laughter. And so I will cherish our memories and what you taught me about life. To continue, to value every moment, and to love these unspoken words. Because as you would have wanted for me, despite the loss, the heartbreak, the struggles, I remain with a smile on my face, hope in my eyes, and love in my heart. For happiness is always a choice. Optimism is always a must. And life will always be a gift. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mildred and Kenny. Next, we'll have another reflection by Regina Husman, followed by Suite Number One by Johann Sebastian Bach, played by Georgia Lowe. To all the donors and their families, I offer my deepest condolence, appreciation, and gratitude for all that you have given. As first-year medical students, we were given the privilege to work very closely with your loved ones as we learn about the purpose of each anatomy that works in concert to sustain life. You see, for many of my classmates, including myself, your loved one was my first real patient. During our anatomy sessions, I would find myself imagining the life that was led by your loved one. Her glittery nails would remind me of an individual who appreciated beauty, while her laugh lines told the story of a loving family, pets, hobbies, and perhaps grandchildren. Although I haven't had the actual opportunity to actually get to know this donor, I know that through her sacrifice and generosity, she is truly an amazing individual who believed in making a difference in the medical education humanity, and morality. You see, we're very, very lucky here at UCLA. For our an anatomy faculty and professors are truly some of the most amazing and passionate educators that I've had the privilege of working under. But however, albeit wonderful, they can only teach us so much. To truly understand and appreciate the human system, we needed to learn from the body itself. Your loved one, was my silent and my best teacher, who taught me more than any textbook or professor could. Therefore, I want to thank you for allowing us to take care of them and for allowing us to learn through them. I especially want to thank the donors for their gifts to medicine. Despite their passing, the donors have imparted to me a legacy of healing, which I will always carry with me during my time with my future patients. Most importantly, however, the donors have taught us the most essential principle and foundation of medicine, that we must sincerely care, respect, and exhibit compassion for our patients in life and in passing. Thank you.
Thank you, George and Regina. For our final student performance, we'll have Lapoon performing a Somewhere Over the Rainbow by Harold Arlen. In this portion of the program, we'd like to thank our donors by reading their first name. With utmost gratitude, we acknowledge the following donors. Emily, Shauna, Cherie, Patricia, Adibi, Gilbert, Elizabeth. Michael, Catherine, William, Yvonne, Ronald, Irene, Terrence, Kathleen, Shelva, Jane, Gladys, America, Robert, Patsy, Irvin, Helene, Sherry, Lanny, Leona, Donald, Joseph, Irvin, Celia, Richard, Marcos, Kale, Maureen, Zoe, Morris, Rico, 
Dorothy, Julia, Avis, Athena, Vincenza, John, Vicky, Sue, Yu Tong, Clyde, Gaston, Jane, Claude, Ruth, Patricia, Helen, Ronald, Milton, Gretchen, Lucy, Fred, Patsy, Charles, Alfred, Lois, Shirley, Albert, Michael, Ruth, John, Lynn, William, Farrell, Brian, Samuel, Mary, William, Vincent, Dennis, Barbara, Thomas, William, Patricia, Shirley, Martha, Robert, Angel, Diane, Mark, Viola, Mildred, Kermit, Kenneth, Carbonell, Cordelia, Susan, Molly, Shirley, Charles, Michael, Anne, Karen, Marguerite, Alan, Myron, Hal, Linda, Terrence, Peter, Bonnie, Nancy, Kenneth, Norman, Spencer, Janice, Evelyn, Aaron, Patrick, Stephanie, Warren, Diana, Joseph, Ronald, Joan, Ronald, John, Ava, Evelyn, Eileen, Martin, Josephine, Marilyn, Yvonne, Ellen, Rubik, Elaine, Carolyn, Harry, Martin, Raymond, Sarkis, Gwen, Betty, Carrie, Kathleen, Matt, Sandra Jo, John, Patrick, Nikila, Sadrudin, Jorge, Ruth, Dora, Anita, Ward, Frank, Paul, Rosemary, Donald, Carl, Porter, Maria, Bonnie, Anne, Francis, Wayne, Edna, Marjorie, Henrietta, Jean, Gerald, Jack, Richard, Lotta, Audencio, Robert, Muriel, John, Davis, Donald, Mabel, Isa, Jean, Jeanette, Paula, Carol, Eleanor, Robert, Dorothy, Alvin, John, Lou, Elizabeth, James, David, Ellen, William, Ismael, Chung Wong, Rhett, Wayne, Shirley, Randall, John, Peter, Shirley May, Carol, John, Matthew. <coughs> I'd now like to invite Reverend Aiko Johnson to the stage to deliver the closing blessing. If you are able, I would like to ask all of the medical students to stand up. Yeah. Let us pray. We give thanks for all that our gracious donors were to those who loved them and for all they were to our community who received their final gift as an offering to the world. 
we remember them and express our utmost gratitude for their legacy. May the life force that poured through their bodies shine forth again and again as the knowledge that we received through them is used for healing purposes. We humbly acknowledge that we have received a lot and are still receiving so much more from them to help not only uncover the miracle of the human body, but also sustain the miracle of life and our hope that we use their gift for the healing of humankind. For the many, many blessings each one has given us in life and in death, we give sincere thanks. Amen. That concludes the 2017 Ceremony of Thanks program. I'd like to humbly thank each and every one of you again for being here and for the gift of your loved ones. If you could join us outside, there are refreshments and food as well as some other stations and please stay, um, feel free to talk with students, um, post your loved ones pictures on the board or on the tables and have a safe trip home. Thank you.